So welcome everyone to the August 24th edition of the research engagement session. And today I'm grateful that we have back to our roots, the, the talk on the Pacific Research Platform, the National Research Platform, the Global Research Platform and Nautilus, hopefully with some words to the Galactic Research Platform in there. And our presenters, uh, Dima Mission and John Graham, both at UC San Diego. Dima is an applications developer, and John Graham is a senior development engineer. And if you want their most comprehensive bios, you can go to the link that Kathy has kindly put in the chat box. And without further ado, I want to hand it over to John and Dima so we can get to the, the fun part. Thank you both for, for being here and sharing with us. Thank you. Um, start out sharing my desktop. That's working for everybody. That looks great. All right. So, uh, yeah, this this week has been um, stressful. We found uh, yet another use of the the shared resources. We're uh, frantically backing up the uh, UC Santa Cruz data. Uh, sets so their their um, data center was locked down by the police, and so we've been streaming ZFS snapshots and S3 and anything else we can pull out of their storage uh, nodes and pushing it into storage all across our the Pacific Research plat Platform. And so we were you know, fortunate enough to have this collaboration and uh, spare storage that wasn't online at the time that we could use to to drop these uh, files in for them. Anyhow, moving on to the presentation, a little background of the 2015 vision of the Pacific Research Platform to connect the science DMZs, creating a regional end-to-end -end, uh, uh, science-driven community. And we really worked on the community part of this, this these weekly calls that we do on Thursdays, our rocket chat, our outreach, our constant uh, development. So this is this is the uh, the place that we like to to live, and so we've been uh, adding uh, more and more uh, research centers uh, through um, our collaborations, and um, it all started with anybody that answers Tom's emails. Of course, uh, it's a good thing to watch for his uh, uh, offers in in your inbox because they usually come attached with hardware. And uh, so we deployed, um, first we deployed all these DTNs, data transfer nodes, uh, to do the disk-to-disk -disk testing and um, tune the hardware, tune the networks in between, and that worked out pretty good. And so we started uh, uh, pushing further out we added nodes in Hawaii. We had uh, nodes at Starlight, uh, uh, NCAR, and um, through Scenic, we have uh, links uh, into all kinds of different uh, high-performance uh, Pacific Wave uh, uh, paths to uh, um, our friends in the Asia. And we're constantly adding um, new uh, regional networks. Uh, NicerNet has been one of our most uh, 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 dramatic uh, upticks in uh, uh, adoption. They've been adding all kinds of nodes and capabilities. It's been a fabulous uh, time working with them. And um, so the internet too has also come on and started dropping a whole bunch of uh, hardware in different uh, locations around their sites and have offered uh, uh, connectivity to campuses that are willing to participate. So that's uh, always helps. And these are all based on these uh, Fiona DTNs, uh, 10, 40 and 100 gig uh, bit connected storage nodes that uh, uh, Phil Papadopoulos and uh, Joe Keefe uh, first uh, developed and uh, we you know, just uh, basically enhanced and, and kept on updating with the latest hardware. Then we added the Chase CI uh, grant that brought in all the GPU nodes. These are uh, really cost efficient game level GPUs that allow you to about $20,000, drop one of these nodes into uh, your rack and uh, you can 
serve up machine learning of all, all flavors. And most recently, we're doing remote desktop sharing uh, using a uh, no VNC uh, virtual GL and turbo VNC for fully uh, virtualized graphics. Um, it's all based on Kubernetes um, uh, orchestration engine uh, that we're all you know, in love with. Uh, Docker containers run inside of that. Everybody and their brothers adopting it. Um, here's the Chase CI grant that uh, that dropped uh, all the GPU servers uh, onto our, our backbone, and then uh, we started uh, uh, finding that more and more people had bigger needs than we could provide and had uh, funding and wanted to bring some hardware to attach to our cluster because it was, uh, uh, it's harder to get this thing going than it, uh, it might uh, um, need to be. But we offer a, a service where we can uh, uh, quickly add your nodes using Ansible scripts into our cluster and then you guys don't have to uh, figure out all the, the uh, tedious uh, installation and management stuff for the sysadmin layers. We're using Admiralty for doing multi-cluster federation. We're using K3S, which is a lightweight Kubernetes for uh, the uh, ARM64 clusters. Uh, we use Cilium as one of our SDN overlay networks. We're also using Calico on our Nautilus production network. We're using Metal LB as a BGP and layer two load balancer for uh, doing uh, ingress that requires more than just HTTPS services. Uh, Chase CI funding um, is aimed about uh, getting uh, FP32 cycles, machine learning uh, needs. They don't need 64-bit. Uh, uh, we've got uh, yeah, 550 uh, GPUs in Nautilus and uh, more awards uh, coming. We've got two petabytes of distributed storage. And uh, one of the uh, nice things is we don't have to pay for rack space and power and networking. That's part of the taxes that we pay to be on the university. Uh, Fiona 8s have been very, very successful. They, uh, they cool the GPUs efficiently, better than four GPU, four U boxes. And we're now delivering about $4 million a year in cloud equivalent GPU computing. Uh, let's see. I think I better speed up. Uh, what we've been doing uh, is uh, we've spent a lot of money on the, uh, the GPUs and uh, they, they, they work for about three years, then you gotta recycle them. And so uh, uh, this, this adds up to about, uh, uh, $14 million in uh, uh, AWS time if you add in the overhead. Let's see. How can you learn more? Well, we can participate, we can explore, and we can federate. So for uh, participation, you can try Nautilus. You can add your own node to Nautilus. You can promote the benefits of potluck supercomputing. You can build your own local cluster. You can deploy solutions for your users and then figure out how to federate this. Uh, for trying Nautilus, we have, uh, uh, you can join our rocket chat and get you know, all the uh, contacts you need to, to move into any of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, resources that we have. We have lots of documentation. We have a, a Jupyter Hub that now supports remote desktop, something that uh, UV Panda at Berkeley developed recently. Uh, create your own namespace, and then deploy your jobs. Uh, this is the Nautilus portal up in the upper right-hand corner. Anybody with CI logon can just come up here and click on logon. Use your campus single sign-on, and you're in. And then you talk to us on Rocket Chat, and uh, we can create a uh, namespace admin for you if one doesn't exist for your organization. Uh, if you want to add your own server to Nautilus, you can clone our Ansible repos, uh, request a new cluster token from our rocket chat, and then add your new node config to the Nautilus host YAML, and then run the Ansible playbook against your new host that you put in the, uh, the uh, Nautilus Ansible um, uh, host. 
some stit, uh, some uh, stats on is is this sustainable? Uh, UCSD uses all of Nautilus, 74% uh, uh, um, of the GPUs and 78% of the CPUs. Now that's right about in line. We have uh, that's about what UCSD invested in the amount of uh, hardware. And then there's lots of other groups that have uh, uh, put in their own hardware that they reserve for their own uses when they're uh, busy and then they release to the, the, the pool when they're not. And some reasons that uh, potluck supercomputing makes sense. And I, um, yeah, we don't have to pay for power. We don't have to pay for space. Um, it's it's easy to work into budgets, and um, is it sustainable? Faculty who contribute hardware get that much time in their box. Uh, if their box dies, they can continue to use it in the potluck model. If uh, uh, if faculty get grants and want to, to contribute more devices like FPGAs, IOTs, more storage, more compute, we can do that. Um, uh, the reason it works is a lot of these faculty can't afford their own sysadmin and they need help uh, with their new students to get them up to speed on this new infrastructure and how to do all kinds of things. And that's one of the things we can, we can support through our chat uh, rooms. And uh, luckily, NFS will continually, well, likely continue funding, funding our, our research to keep us ahead of the curve. We can compete with Azure, Google, and uh, uh, AWS, but yeah, that'll go away. But if uh, it's really the cost of the, the, uh, the system administration and support that makes this affordable because we're pooling our resources and our knowledge. Will the cloud win? Probably, but it won't support, uh, provide the user support. It won't provide the innovation. Uh, it just won't do it the way we can do it currently. All right, so I'm gonna pass this off to Dima now and I will stop sharing and he can continue, continue on. Okay, am I sharing? Yes, you are. Good. So how do we make this all work? A huge part of it is measuring and monitoring. We need to know what's happening in the cluster. We need to see which things broke and why do, did they break and how to fix them. Um, yeah, users, uh, Pinging us in Rocket Chat is a great way to monitor something, but that's the, for the beginning. And then we advance our monitoring tools and we find stuff broken before users tell us that something happened. And we have a, we are working with a couple of projects like Inman and Reservoir Labs on improving our tools and uh, they take advantage of our cluster because they can uh, get a hold of uh, more than a hundred nodes around the world and uh, all the networking uh, statistics and they uh, then like Inmon can uh, use their knowledge for their uh, commercial customers, but they can train in our cluster. Um, and I will talk about GitLab and Next cloud and other projects. So for monitoring, the primary tool we use is uh, Prometheus uh, with visualization in Grafana. That's uh, pretty much the standard way now to do this. Uh, Prometheus is pulling a bunch of statistics from exporters. Uh, some are provided by Kubernetes. Some we just run ourselves, like for GPUs and some are really custom ones, but that holds like probably 70% of our monitoring stuff. And on this screen, uh, you can see GPU usage 
uh, for about two years. I think this is uh, 18 and 19 years and we started from just 100 GPUs and the use was increasing. This blue one is OSG and they're running in scavenging mode. So if somebody wants to take those GPUs and do something on them, then OSG pods go away and another project starts on them. And then when GPUs are released, then OSG returns on them. But you can see that it grew from 100 to uh, 400 GPUs just in 19. Uh, this is a dashboard for Ceph. Uh, again, we have, now we have four Ceph pools in our cluster and this is a dashboard for the larger one. And when something breaks or when it's getting slow, it's super useful. This is dashboard for uh, GPUs on the GPUs on the nodes, and uh, there are like thirty or forty dashboards total, so they are all very useful. Um, for network monitoring, uh, we're using Perfsonar. Uh, these are examples of a general uh, latency dashboard. So here I'm trying to keep all the nodes from different universities so that we see connectivity between different sites. And then uh, there are additional dashboards for uh, tracking connectivity inside the university because we cannot do just end-to-end -end dashboard, it's too big. And here we can see when like some university is having uh, like some routing issues to another one. Um, most often it happens because MTU drops to 1500. So all our whole cluster except just two nodes uh, is using MTU 9000. And when the university goes on reserve path, it's often uh, going to commodity internet with 1500. And so we immediately see this on the dashboard and we ping the uh, admins in the university to re restore the MTU or just deal with it. And here is an example of dashboard for 100 gig uh, nodes throughput tests. This is memory to memory and it's using a Microsoft tool called Ether for uh, tests. Uh, we found that Hyper of 3 is not uh, getting anything close to 100 gig. The maximum we saw in Hyper of 3 is like 30 gig. And Ether can actually run multiple threads on multiple cores. And here we see like green is above 75 gigs per second. And yellow is above uh, 50 gig, 50 to 75. So this is pretty good. This is mostly inside UCSD, this big uh, green cl cluster and some internet two nodes are showing green but others are yellow and here's an example of the plot that persona provides um, also we are collecting flow data using s flow uh, connectors and they're sending uh, flow data to several projects in parallel. Uh, one of them is called Elastiflow. It's uh, running in Elasticsearch database and it's providing several dashboards. Like here we can see uh, aggregated traffic in the cluster by a port. So it's, it can guess the application from the port. And also we can see which nodes contribute uh, like most the uh, traffic in the cluster. Uh, here we see the map uh, with the big uh, traffic sites and also we see that some traffic is coming from Europe and Asia and uh, so we can see where our clients are and this is uh, again flows between different IPs. Also it can show between ASs. Um, the Inmon is, we are working with Neil McKee. Um, so he is developing new stuff for Inmon in our cluster. 
And uh, this is super useful. Uh, it's basically aggregating all kinds of uh, exporters. So he is querying Kubernetes API directly, plus he is getting SFlow data, plus I, I think he's using uh, node labels for some stuff uh, that we labeled manually. And plus he is using uh, Prometheus. So this is an example of a network dashboard. Uh, on the right, it's for CPU memory read. So this is slow level, just the uh, node statistics. And this is useful to see if like some user is pounding on a node and it's getting slow, like we can see why it's happening. And on the bottom, this is traffic between the nodes again for network. But Neil is developing uh, just a bunch of very useful dashboards and we're very glad that we have this collaboration. And uh, now we have this uh, free version of InMon in, cluster, in the cluster and also we have uh, Traffic Sentinel, which is paid version, but uh, well, they are providing it for us for free because of this collaboration. And so we can enjoy having it. Uh, another tool I wrote myself is a Traceroute tool. So it's getting uh, Traceroute statistics from Personar and also using uh, throughput tests from Personar. And here we can see the graph of all connections in our cluster. And also it's overlaying the throughput results for each segment and it helps us finding the bad links like which segment is underperforming in our mesh. And now we're working on a 3D version of this with students to improve it and also to put, uh, the, this tool now is just uh, showing the latest data, but we are going to put all the data in database as a graph so that we can go back in time and see the changes like how the graph uh, changed and when things break that that would be useful. Uh, this is very new collaboration with Reservoir Labs. Uh, they are also pulling our Personar data, the trace routes and throughput, and they are build, finding what's called elephant flows. So they are finding um, connections which affect uh, throughput between multiple nodes and which are underperforming. Uh, and they, their algorithm can make suggestions and our hope is that they even can automatically reroute our traffic so that we can improve our total throughput in the cluster. And this is example, I uh, think white are flows and gray are li links. Uh, and so the ones on top are the most, um, like having the most traffic so that if we want to improve something, we, t we take the flows from the top and we work on them and uh, that should improve their performance. And this is, oh, this is uh, the whole cluster and this is bottleneck. So here we can see which flows are the bottlenecks on the right. But this is just work in progress right now. And uh, so controlling cluster is getting harder and harder. Uh, we now have 160 nodes and it's just me and John. And like from the times we had just 10 nodes, I'm trying to automate as much as, I, as possible. So if there are like tasks that I do several times, I automated them automate them right away. And the best, best way to manage something is when I don't need to even look at it or push some button and that's done by Kubernetes operators. Uh, Kubernetes has um, so-called controllers. Uh, that's a daemon that's watching some resource and is trying to drive its state towards the wanted state. 
And we have several operators. One is watching users and their uh, utilization of our resources. Another one is watching uh, one is watching GPUs, like when GPUs break, uh, nodes, uh, Kubernetes tries to schedule pods on the, this GPU, GPU node and all of them break. So this operator is uh, coordinating the nodes and notifying us that we need to replace the GPU. So it's super useful uh, and I'm trying to use operators as much as possible. And also that's the way most uh, big software projects are going now in Kubernetes. Uh, there are operators already for Elasticsearch, for Postgres, like all this knowledge about how to fix something can be scripted and programmed and then you just run the application that does the work for you. And it's, it's called DevOps. So uh, that's a transition from uh, sysadmins. So sysadmins do stuff manually, but DevOps develop software that uh, manages the cluster. And that's a big thing in Kubernetes. Uh, sometimes there are some tasks that need some automation, like, uh, for example, if I update some software or I need to make changes in monitoring, like add a new dashboard or something, uh, I'm trying not to, again, do it manually. Um, there, there's a, we're using GitLab for storing all kinds of code. And GitLab also has what's called CICD, continuous integration and continuous uh, delivery. Um, I can just write once uh, how I want stuff to be deployed. And then on every push I make to, the, to Git, it will assemble, test, build containers, push containers to the registry, update uh, those containers in the cluster and so on. So it does everything that I would otherwise have to do myself. And this is super useful. Like on this example, it's a, a workflow to build Jupyter containers that we use. Uh, this is spawned from Jupyter Stack project. So it's building like eight different containers uh, for our Jupyter lab. And so the only thing I need to do is make a change. Like if, uh, if they update it or like there is a new version of Jupyter and it will build eight containers for me and push to GitLab. And some projects are even starting uh, stuff in Kubernetes if that's needed. Uh, also, there are some low level uh, node configuration uh, tasks like updating CUDA drivers, uh, doing node storage, like for partitioning disks, stuff like that. Everything is now scripted in Ansible. And there is a repo in GitLab for Ansible. And again, um, so if I need to update a bunch of nodes, we use Ansible for that. And for to initially set up nodes. Uh, next cloud is our, um, it's, it's kind of like Dropbox or Google Drive, but we host it ourselves again in our cluster and it's pointing to Ceph. Um, and it's getting more and more used now. So if users want to move data into our cluster, um, like from their local machine, let's say, they can just drag and drop it into Nextcloud and then they have access to it from inside the cluster using WebDev or even S3. Like we can connect S3 directly to Nextcloud. And there are a bunch of uh, plugins for Nextcloud, like you can pull data into our cluster directly into Nextcloud from a URL uh, and some others. Federation. So this is all great, but it's just one cluster which is uh, growing, but we cannot expand it uh, indefinitely. And we have a vision to continue our project as a federation of uh, same level clusters. And when we just started looking at it, um, we couldn't find any project that will fit our needs because most federation projects are 
um, having one cluster controlling a bunch of other clusters. And in our case, it doesn't work because everyone will want to have their own and then they just want to share some uh, part of resources. And then we uh, found this Admiralty project, uh, which allowed us to build what we want. And now we are working with a developer of it and I'm actually a contributor to that project. And that project allows federating on namespace to namespace level or cluster to cluster if that's wanted. So users who have a namespace in, let's say, Nautilus and they have their own small cluster can federate just their namespace without even talking to me or saying, hey, I want to federate. So they uh, can do it on their own. And also they fully control what, the, what permissions they uh, our cluster has in their own cluster. And also this is super useful to bring in uh, different kinds of uh, special hardware. Like we have a small K3S ARM64 cluster and uh, federated to ours. And GitLab can build uh, container images for ARM on that separate cluster by federation. So this GitLab namespace is federated. And this opens a bunch of other possibilities. Like now we're working on federating with Windows cluster. Um, so any special kind of cluster or like controlled by somebody else can be federated into ours. And the big one is Expanse will have what's called composable systems. So that's another Kubernetes cluster and that, that will be federated or uh, I'm not sure what will be federated into what, but they will have uh, again one level federation and Expanse will be able to run some jobs in Nautilus uh, and project that is currently running in Nautilus, the Wi-Fi will just partly move into expense. So the, all the work they've done already in Nautilus can remain there and then just partly move to expense. Uh, as I said, it's one level uh, as opposite to uh, hierarchy of uh, clusters. And another great way, this is just a recent update in Admiralty uh, it's now using what's called virtual kubelet. Kubelet is what's controlling everything in Kubernetes. And uh, now Admiralty is fully leveraging all the schedulers and like all the automation in Kubernetes. Instead of trying to mimic it and doing like a stripped out version of uh, Kubernetes, is just using uh, Kubernetes itself and it's deploying like virtual version of another cluster. So this is pretty cool. Um, and I think this is the, like, the most advanced uh, federation uh, project for now. And you, uh, clusters can set flexible permissions in, to allow other clusters to federate. Uh, these are, John, you want to talk about this? Sure, yeah. These are some of the gadgets that were hanging on our our K3S cluster, the one on the left is a, a Jetson Xavier. Uh, the one to the right of that is a, a Jetson Nano. And then our favorite one is the uh, Google Edge TPU. They have the, the dev board. And then right beside it, there's the Coral. That's just the uh, accelerator, the TPU accelerator on a USB form factor. So you can plug that into one of the Jetson devices. And then next slide uh, is, this is uh, one of the new uh, Xilinx uh, M73 cameras and it's got, uh, sorry, it's a Mobotix M73, but it's got a Xilinx FPGA built into it. And uh, this camera can hold three sensors uh, um, and they could be thermal imaging cameras uh, day, night, multiple uh, fields of view, and uh, they can do um, thermal facial uh, scanning in camera 
for COVID. It's one of the features that they released recently is for detecting people coming in the door with a temperature. So could be very handy. Uh, is there any other, other slides there, Dima? Oh, I think is, yes, our acknowledgements. Uh, go ahead and stop sharing and I'll share my screen again real quick. And over here. All right, so this is uh, one of the things that we've been working on. This is a thing that we're calling NodeGL. It's a, a VNC-based uh, HTML5 desktop. Uh, we are, in fact, in a Chrome web browser. And if we go full screen on this, I'm running Houdini on a, a node at UCSD, but I'm operating it uh, using my 4G cell phone connection while simultaneously screen, uh, streaming it to Zoom. So this uh, allows us to put uh, massive compute into a shared desktop environment where multiple people can log in. And this is a 300 cube voxel simulation of a smoke sim. And this will clock out at uh, 24 frames a second uh, on the local node. And then your VNC session will stream that to you as fast as your connection will allow. So this is one of the you know, most popular things that we've been working on recently to uh, overcome all the remote uh, learning. Uh, so these remote desktops are, are, are becoming very um, important for uh, all the people that are now working from home. They used to have you know, stacks of computers in the library and in computer labs that no one sits in front of anymore. And so how do you provide the same services with all the software that used to be physically installed on those nodes? How do you virtualize that? And so this is uh, uh, something that we've been working on for about you know, a year and a half. We knew it was possible, but we finally kicked it out and got it working. So I think uh, we should open it up for questions. We've got about 15 minutes left. John, how does the um, camera do uh, that you um, brought up? How does that do on partial face recognition with a mask? I don't know. I mean, it's thermal scanning, so it's just going to look for the temperature of the exposed skin. So uh, I'm not sure if they require you to pull your mask down to, to get a valid scan in or what, but you know, that could be, you know, a go no go thing on your facial recognitions like lift your head up great thanks so maybe just a question for john and dima jointly is if you look at the broad swath of researchers and science and um you know, code and applications that are running across all of, all of Nautilus. Do you have a few examples, you know, maybe like top three of uh, research activities that have really benefited from what's unique within Nautilus? Mm -hmm. so that's easy to do. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of different things we bring up. Well, I think the, the burstable um, capabilities of Nautilus uh, have proven helpful in like the folding at home and then the uh, uh, open force field work that we're doing for COVID to be able to rapidly respond by deploying systems. Uh, that's been really helpful. Um, just the potluck supercomputing concept alone allows you to amplify the assets that you have by throwing them into a common pool and getting much more than you could ever afford back out of that same pool. So that, I, I think, in general, that, that uh, the model is, is valid just because, you know, we let everybody in as long as they, you know, they're, they have a reasonable goal. <laughs> yeah, we're serving what's called long tail in its entirety. So we have a ton of like small student projects that would not ever land on supercomputer and they just come and run their 
right. stuff. And then there are huge like OSG and open force field, which yeah. also can run like hundreds of GPUs at a time. Ice cube scavenging all the, uh, the nodes when we're not using them. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, keeping our, our hardware hot has, has been one of our goals. And sometimes we overdo it. Yeah, I recently discovered that CMS is running their backup. Uh, I forgot the name of the system, but basically their backup controller is running in our cluster. Yeah. We also found that LIGO has an experimental uh, Ruscio deployment in our cluster. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, it's quite amazing to start exploring what is going on. So one of the other things is uh, folks at uh, Starlight Northwestern needed to do some you know, high speed testing to 100 gig nodes. So we can, we have a lot of that. And so we can give them access to uh, containers on those nodes and to the physical nodes to do testing. So that, that's uh, you know, something that you, you typically don't find. So there's a question in the chat, uh, is the pool not constantly oversubscribed? Um, it is not, we're, so there is no reservation and uh, there is no good answer for how much I can use. You can use as much as you want, as long as you don't fill the cluster. And like in, sometimes before, like before the conferences, everyone wants to use like the whole cluster and then we need to, tell them to scale down, but in other times, somebody like a cluster is relatively free, then somebody can come and scale up. And we, because we provide all the monitoring to users, they can figure out themselves, like how much they can use and adjust that. Right. So if somebody just comes and runs a 4,000 pods, they immediately get banned and until they like learn how to play with other spots. For most people, it's working, and uh, like most users can figure out how to get the uh, biggest use without like getting all the resources and affecting others. The best way is to talk to us in Racket Chat, and then we can figure out how to optimize your workflow uh, without destroying everyone else's. Yeah. Do also, often uh, people run an efficient code. And we don't allow that, like we tell them to optimize it. And when they optimize, they sometimes use 10 times less resources. Yeah. Let me jump in for just a sec. So one of the reasons this works is also that these are fundamentally 32-bit GPU, uh, FP32 computers. And um, this, so they're not really suitable for HPC. And so we're not overwhelmed by people saying, uh, move, trying to migrate from um, the supercomputer centers. Uh, we don't want that. We don't want to encourage that. We're not doing that. We're mainly focusing on machine learning and computational media, uh, which work fine with 32-bit and also work fine on the, the game GPUs that don't have error correcting memory, which uh, people in high performance computing certainly turn their noses up at. So, uh, and it turns out, ironically, in machine learning, if you introduce noise into the algorithms, you make them better. So I guess, and you know, if things drop dead, you just, they all um, uh, restart anyway. So um, they're very flexible that way. We have a bunch of big users, um, and big user for me is somebody uses more than eight GPUs on a 24 by seven by 365 basis, and there's only half a dozen of them. Almost everybody else uh, bursts someplace between one GPU per year, which is actually a lot if, you, uh, if you're spiking. It really means that you're running uh, eight GPUs or 20 GPUs when you want them. And so that's worked pretty well. Uh, and, uh, but it's not, you know, it's not for every user. We're not trying to uh, replace the clouds. We're not trying to replace the supercomputer centers. We're just trying to deal with this group of people that we identified a few years ago as being very underserved, which is the machine learning people. Now, there's lots of things that are figured this out in the three or four years that we've been doing this. We're seeing the clouds have more and more GPU resources, uh, even FP32 ones. And uh, there's other ways to do these kinds of things like uh, you know, TensorFlow. So it's moving very fast. 
um, we're trying to still be useful because we can deal with very heterogeneous um, computing things that people might want to stick on these, this uh, Nautilus cluster. And uh, you know, the other thing that I, we can't stress too much is that unlike businesses that have a, a, a clear concept of CapEx versus OpEx, uh, for universities it's inverted. And so where it's pretty easy for us to get chunks of money to buy stuff in a one, one time shot, uh, it's very hard to get operation expenses uh, year after year after year. Uh, it's partially the, because of the competitive way we operate and partially because of the, the way we, uh, uh, the bureaucrats we work for. So um, anyway, we're taking advantage of that. And John said, of course, we're taking advantage of hosting, giving us free power that we pay for out of our overhead anyway and free space and free networking, not to mention that. That's an extremely valuable thing that we get from Scenic Internet too and Nizernet, Great Plains Networks and the other places, uh, Pacific Wave, the other places we play with. So that's kind of what makes it work. Uh, the unscalable part of it really is, uh, is kind of Dima and John. And so we're trying to figure out how to scale them through automation and that's um, and machine learning. And so that's kind of the trick uh, that the next adventure is all about. Elon just released a new uh, update on the neural link. So one oh. of the other things that the FP64 devices, uh, GPUs typically don't offer is the video pipes required to do remote desktop stuff. So to, to, to be able to do these shared desktops, the VNC stuff, you have to have the game cards. I think uh, Igor has been answering them sort of in a chat, but I thought it would be great if, if uh, some of the questions, there's some really great questions uh, in the chat, if you could answer some of those verbally, I think it'd be great for everybody to, especially in more depth, especially some of the things about the uh, prioritization or allocations, those types of things. Well, who do you want us to answer? <laughs> yeah, I can answer about priorities and stuff. Um, there are projects that uh, do say similar things to HPC. Uh, like you can do quotas, you can do fair scheduling, all that stuff. But when, <laughs> when I ask people whether we should implement it, they're like, no, 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 we want this home feeling of uh, like we just come and try grabbing something and like talking rocket chat, or can I use more? And so they like it. Nobody wants to another HPC cluster here. But some projects that, that actually want bigger queues um, can install this kind of uh, queue inside their namespace and use it. We also have some uh, ways of having priority, for instance, in the Sun Cave, which has 70 GPUs, when we're actually using that, as we used to uh, six months ago, uh, for um, walk-in virtual reality, uh, the, you simply turn off all the Kubernetes users and, um, and run the Sun Cave, and then as soon as you were done, you turn it back on again and all these jobs would come back. So that's one way of prioritizing Another way is that sometimes uh, uh, people who have contributed significant resources uh, want to lock up those resources because they got a big paper coming up or, or something they need to do and get done and uh, we can give them exclusive use to their resources, uh, which makes people happy about, you know, throwing things into the potluck supercomputing concept because they believe uh, that when they need it, they can lock it down. Um, so that's worked out pretty well too. We don't have to do that very often, but it is the it is a possibility. Another question was whether we require a node to participate in our cluster. No, it's not required. It will be appreciated, and you get more uh, resources and priority. But you don't require to bring in a node. And Thanks for the comment, Alex Feltis. And Alex, 
<laughs> Since we're at the near the top of the hour, I think Alex's comment deserves to be heard into the record. Uh, Alex, do you want to say it? Can Can I talk? Yes. Oh, cool. Oh, no, the, the one thing I, I, I missed the beginning of this, but one thing that's really important is this democratized system. And I've been using it to teach my students um, how to use, do cloud computing, Kubernetes cloud computing, and uh, develop workflows. And some of our workflows, I probably would, I probably have burnt up about, I don't know, $10 million for the credits, you know, developing things on the PRP. So it's, it's critical to have a system like this before moving the cloud for training and development. So thank you very much. You're welcome. I, I have to admit, I've, I've had the great fortune of spending some time talking with Alex and others on how the workflows have been set up or how they can be improved to use this environment. And I think that may be the, the, a little bit of a gap uh, for a lot of the participants in this call. I think it'd be fantastic if a subsequent, maybe actually looking at a specific workflow uh, for, you know, show, you know, the, the whole process, because it can be daunting to look at these uh, Ansible scripts and look at these YAML files and try to understand what to do to convert a workflow into a job that can be submitted on a cluster. And so I don't know if you could possibly set up a time where maybe through the campus champions or something else where you just take and hold a workflow and uh, show how that happens. Because I think that would help close the gap and answer a lot of questions. Uh, I think that'd be great. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so where should people write to if they have more questions? Um, us <laughs> subscribe to the rocket chat. <laughs> nope. Exactly. Rocket chat will keep you busy. Yeah. So yeah. So I just so thanks. Thank you, John and Dima, for for coming today. And this has been fantastic. I hope everyone's learned a lot about Nautilus and PRP, NRP, GRP, and get involved and participate. And get on rocket chat. Thank you all very much, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye, Thank all. You. Bye, all.